All right. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to um, the land use meeting for the month of March. Uh, we have a reasonably long agenda today, so um, we're going to kick it off momentarily. Um, first, quick attendance vote. Uh, Jake Gold, present. Damaris Reyes. I see she's here. Present, I'm here, I'm here. Thank you. Um, I know Alistair is here and will be here momentarily. Andrea Gordillo, I think will be a little bit late. Herman Hewitt. Yes. Uh, Trevor Holland. Present. Thank you, Trevor. Laura Lugo. No. Sandra Struther. No. Jackie Wong. No. Dominic Berg. Present. Thank you, Dominic. Uh, Ariadna Chua. Uh, it looks like she is in the audience. One moment, let me promote you to panelist. Welcome, Ariadna. Steve Herrick. Absent. Megan Joy, I think will be a little bit late. And Anisha Steven. Here. Thank you, Anisha. All right, first order of business. Uh, we are going to approve the minutes from our last meeting, which was in January. Uh, without objection, the minutes are approved. Anyone? Cool. Uh, so we'll move on to an informational presentation from the Department of City Planning on the City of Yes Citywide Zoning Text Amendments. Uh, Francesca, are you going to want to share your screen or Asuka? I would love to. Yes, please, if possible. All right. Let me make you a co-host so you can do that. Okay. All right. I believe... Can you see this? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, wonderful. Um, and I'm just going to, I seem to be a little frozen. All right, so thank you so much uh, to all of you and good evening. Um, it's nice to meet some of you virtually for the first time. Um, my name is Francesca Bruce and I am the new community board liaison for you lovely folks in community board three. Uh, tonight, I'll be presenting our City of Yes initiatives. Um, so in October, we held two uh, public info sessions. And so for those who were able to attend, some of this information may be familiar. Um, but for those who um, for whom it isn't or uh, who have questions, uh, we'll leave some time at the end of the presentation for questions. And I will answer to the best of my ability. Uh, but fair warning, I may not have all the answers. Um, I am, of course, happy to follow up through email after the presentation with answers to any remaining questions. So in June, Mayor Adams announced the city of yes. These proposals will use the city's zoning tools to support economic recovery, expand housing opportunities in every neighborhood and accelerate the transition to a greener energy future. Since then, DCP has been analyzing the zoning resolution to identify rules that might be barriers to the city's progress. Um, and we wanna reiterate that details and you know, the specifics of these proposals are very much yet to be determined. Uh, and we're deeply focused on public engagement and connecting with community leaders like yourselves, uh, community boards, elected officials really early. Uh, so we look forward to continuing those conversations and hearing your ideas on how to shape these proposals. Uh, the three proposals that we are working on currently include zoning for carbon neutrality, which will seek to support citywide uh, carbon reduction and other greenhouse emission efforts by enabling clean energy and other sustainable practices uh, in both new and existing buildings. Uh, zoning for economic opportunity, 
which will provide local businesses with the ability to repurpose vacant spaces by removing outdated limitations that are keeping them from getting filled, for example, um, and zoning for housing opportunity, which will encourage the creation of more housing in neighborhoods across the city, uh, including by allowing the additional housing types, easing conversions, reducing parking requirements, that kind of thing. But we'll get into all of that uh, shortly. So currently DCP is actively shaping and refining all three proposals through continued engagement with experts in the field, local groups, and the community. Uh, we will host another info session, as I say, uh, this will be in five days, so March 20th, uh, to discuss updates to our research on all three initiatives with a focus on carbon neutrality in this case. Um, DCP estimates that zoning for carbon neutrality will be filed and referred out next month, uh, probably late month, uh, followed by zoning for economic development around like mid-year of the fall, and lastly, zoning for housing opportunity around the beginning of 2024. Uh, because carbon neutrality, uh, that initiative will be referred out next month, uh, and it's the primary focus of this month's info sessions, most of what we cover today will be related to that proposal, but we'll cover all three a little bit. So zoning for carbon neutrality looks at how zoning can support our city's climate goals, specifically uh, achieving carbon neutrality and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So um, why carbon? As you know, we are facing a climate crisis largely fueled by carbon dioxide emissions, which largely come from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, in 2016, the world community joined together to sign the Paris Climate Agreement a vision to curtail human greenhouse gas emissions in order to limit overall global warming to two degrees Celsius and thus prevent further environmental damage associated with climate change. Since 2013, so predating that agreement, New York City put forward a plan to reduce emissions by 80% by 2050. So that's our 80 by 50 plan. Um, and we will circle back on that, uh, but that might be familiar to some of you. And it might be a good moment to ask ourselves what we mean by carbon neutral. So a carbon neutral city is one that focuses on reducing operational carbon emissions in line with <clears throat> the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement, reducing our overall energy needs by retrofitting almost every building in the city to become highly efficient to reduce wasted energy, um, cleaning the grid by switching from a fossil fuel powered electricity to renewables like solar and wind, and electrifying all remaining energy needs. And that includes our vehicles and our buildings, et cetera. Um, and as you can see from this chart, the key driver of our city's carbon emissions by far is our building sector. And there's a big relationship between our buildings and the zoning laws that govern them. So that lands us here. And it's of course not our first pass at this reform. 10 years ago in 2012, the department issued zone green which was the first comprehensive overhaul of our zoning to support emerging green technologies like rooftop wind and solar. The current initiative is a chance to revisit Zone Green after 10 years, to update it, to adjust it in light of the many technical and legal changes since, um, changes like the city's 80 by 50 plan, which I referenced earlier, um, and I apologize for any background noise. Um, the reason, zoning for carbon neutrality is relatively limited to this in scope compared to the other initiatives is that it attempts to respond to the ambitious and sweeping local law 97 passed in 2019. So we're mainly focused on removing obstacles here. Uh, there are so many challenges that home and building owners are facing in responding to our climate emergency and we're busy analyzing our zoning regulations to ensure that zoning isn't one of the things holding people back from making climate smart investments. To a lesser extent, we are also taking a look at incentives, uh, for example, aligning existing incentives with the way uh, new New York City energy code works um, and will work in successive updates into the future. Um, and then finally, we're also taking a particularly close look at solar and energy storage in response to the city and state's ambitious goals for these technologies uh, along time horizons that are actually sooner than 2050. For instance, um, New York City's goal to have 1000 megawatts of solar installed by 2030. And I should note, uh, current estimates have us around 300 megawatts installed currently, so not nothing. So zoning for carbon neutrality would focus on fixing impediments in four key areas. 
These are also the four key areas from our city's roadmap to 80 by 50. Uh, and that includes supporting a renewable energy grid and energy storage. Uh, it includes supporting building retrofits, supporting the growth of electric vehicles and micro mobility, and then finally supporting our city efforts to reduce our solid waste and stormwater output. And we'll see a little bit of that in a moment. So not all the examples that um, we're going to be discussing today will be applicable to every area of the city. These are examples of the kind of things that we're thinking about citywide, uh, and we hope to determine what is most appropriate and where in collaboration with communities. So I will encourage you all to uh, attend the hearing, uh, excuse me, public info sessions that are coming up. Um, and we'll go over five key examples of the types of problems that DCP is looking into with regard to this first initiative, uh, carbon neutrality. So this first example is a building owner looking to add solar panels to their building. In 2012, Zone Green created new rules to allow rooftop solar to be installed above rooftops. This initiative did have limitations on the heights uh, of the panels themselves, um, heights and setbacks from the facade and rooftop coverage caps, uh, so that with the, uh, the current zoning rules and other rules adopted since 2012, only a small proportion of the building is allowed to actually have a solar canopy. And here, uh, the red tinted portions of this rooftop solar canopy would not be permitted under our current zoning regulations. Only the portion outlined in green would be allowed. So we're looking at um, making that a little simpler and easier. The next example is energy storage. Um, energy storage systems, also known as ESS, essentially save energy generated by the sun and wind for peak times of demand, such as a summer day when millions of New Yorkers need an AC to stay cool. Um, however, this is not addressed in our zoning text currently. DCP has been and will continue to work with our partners, uh, Department of Buildings, um, FDNY, to explore uh, safe and appropriate as of right allowances to support the broad adoption of energy storage across the city. A third example here is building retrofits. So currently zoning is a barrier to many building owners looking for opportunities to create healthier homes through retrofits. Um, and here in this diagram is shown an example of a building reclad, which means the replacing of the existing external building facade. Um, a building reclad provides opportunities to improve the performance of a building, such as its energy efficiency. Um, if a typical mid-century office building removes a thin, say, four-inch curtain wall and tries to replace it with a thicker one, say about 11 inches, that's more high performance, they run into a really critical problem, which is that zoning considers wall thickness to be part of the building's FAR or floor area ratio. And that's basically the amount of square footage of development rights that you're permitted on your property. So that if your building was built to its maximum floor area ratio, uh, which is generally the case, uh, then replacing your curtain wall with a thicker one would increase your FAR, which is not allowed. So this zoning prohibition stops the retrofit completely dead in its tracks. And in this example, among many, um, you know, this is a technical glitch that we are cataloging and plan to resolve as part of this ongoing work. Next, we'll discuss, uh, oh, and I think this is a really interesting one as well, um, EV chargers, so the transportation sector. There are many hurdles to EV adoption, including cost, supply chain, federal policy. Zoning may not be the biggest issue, but we believe that there are barriers that are created through our zoning to expanding EV. Um, for example, one of the biggest challenges to owning an EV is finding an off-street parking space to charge the car overnight. So on-street charging is regulated by the Department of Transportation. Our zoning rules regulate off-street parking. Some ways that zoning can expand options for EV charging include things like um, allowing freestanding electric gas stations in a wide range of zoning districts across the city, which is currently not allowed in many zoning districts. Um, it might include allowing building owners to permit the general public to use their EV charging infrastructure that they build 
Um, so currently zoning allows EV charging to be added to existing parking facilities as an accessory use. But for example, if the space was constructed in a residential building, zoning only allows the residents of the building to use that infrastructure. So DCP is looking at expanding this rule so that EV chargers can, you know, that are in the community can benefit from, benefit from this infrastructure. Um, and then lastly, we'll discuss solid waste uh, and stormwater management, which I know is a big concern. Uh, so while our waste stream is a relatively small part of the city's carbon footprint, um, DCP is thinking through other opportunities to reach our sustainability goals. And when stormwater uh, flows into our combined sewer system, it's directed to the city's stormwater treatment plants where it must be cleaned before being returned to the environment. Uh, however, this water could instead be retained on site. And one way to do that is through the use of bioswales or rain gardens, which absorb extra stormwater during storm events and then slowly release that water over time. Um, so right now, zoning requires street trees to be installed along the sidewalk whenever a new development or enlargement occurs, um, but zoning only specifies that these trees be installed on a standard tree pit. Uh, but there's an opportunity here to update those rules to allow for other innovative designs, such as rain gardens, such as those designed by Department of Transportation or Environmental Protection, um, as the one depicted here, um, those could be used as well. So zoning for economic opportunity is looking to make it easier to locate and grow a business in New York City, which I know is vitally important. Um, it also takes aim at our storefront vacancy crisis by modernizing and clarifying the city zoning, allowing a wider variety of activities that will create vibrancy on our commercial streets and ultimately hopefully lower the cost and time of starting a new business as well. So our goals for this initiative are to support economic recovery and resiliency by doing things like allowing existing space to be repurposed to support economic activity, um, modifying rules to help create flexible spaces that meet the needs of businesses, supporting the growth of job centers and transit accessible areas across the five boroughs to bring jobs closer to New Yorkers. Um, so we'll take a look at some examples to demonstrate the types of challenges that we're trying to address. Uh, and the opportunities that we see uh, to meet these goals. And again, to my earlier point, these examples relate to issues citywide and will determine what is most appropriate and where in collaboration with communities. So here we have a community member who is concerned about dark stores, like those 15 minute grocery delivery companies you may have noticed cropping up and the impact they're having on the neighborhood. Um, zoning does not I mean, zoning does have ground floor requirements in some locations that relate to design, but the rules change from neighborhood to neighborhood and they don't apply equally in some areas of the city. So we are trying to strike a balance between consistent and clear rules that don't place a new financial or regulatory burden on small businesses. Um, another example here is an artist in Harlem wants to open a studio to teach arts to children. They have found a space for lease in a C4 commercial zoning district, uh, but art studios and many other commercial uses like it are not permitted on the ground floor within 50 feet of the street wall. So they'll have to keep looking to find another zoning district that would allow this. Um, New York City has more than 8,500 vacant storefronts, and we know the Lower East Side and Chinatown have a sizable share. Uh, zoning for economic opportunity hopes to take aim at our storefront vacancy crisis by allowing for a wider variety of activities to occur in our commercial zones, um, opening up more spaces for new kinds of businesses to locate and reducing storefront vacancy across the city and creating thousands of new jobs. Um, one of the ways that we hope to do this is by fixing outdated prohibition on some activities on the ground floor, such as art and dance studios. And then lastly, I'll briefly walk you through our initial research on zoning for housing opportunity. Um, so our goals for this initiative are to build on the Where We Live plan, which was New York City's plan to affirmatively further fair housing and address the human costs of the housing shortage. Um, similar to the other initiatives, the goal here is to promote equitable housing development across New York City, 
So DCP has been analyzing the zoning text to see where the rules have been restrictive to the development of housing to ensure that all neighborhoods have the ability to add a variety of housing in low, medium, and high density districts. Um, so some of the changes that teams are analyzing right now for medium and higher density neighborhoods include researching housing types such as affordable dwelling units, smaller units, shared housing. Um, they're also studying how to ease conversions of underutilized buildings to housing, reducing or eliminating unnecessary parking requirements to unlock housing potential, and ultimately finding ways to give all supportive and affordable housing the same incentives as stuff like affordable uh, senior housing or the heirs program for those of you that are familiar. So in this example, we have an old building that has all studio units. Um, today, a building like this would face too many obstacles um, to being developed because they would run into an issue with the dwelling unit factor that mandates minimum average unit sizes. Uh, we understand that having a healthy mix of unit types is important, but this particular example addresses another important need, which is that New Yorkers across many generations would like the opportunity to live alone. Um, by making adjustments to our zoning text, more individuals would have more housing choices other than finding roommates, say, and living in otherwise family-sized apartments. Um, in this example, a nonprofit acquired vacant hotel and wants to convert it to supportive housing. Um, our current zoning rules allow for um, adaptive reuse and don't apply to this particular conversion um, to supportive housing. Uh, if they wanted to turn the vacant hotel into residential units, say, the dwelling unit factor would require extensive construction to combine multiple hotel rooms into individual apartments. So we would like to make it easier to leverage conversions uh, in creating supportive housing and make it easier for nonprofits, say, or small businesses to do this work. So I could go on, but I want to leave time for questions and feedback. And I'll just finish by reminding you that the next public information sessions for carbon neutrality and the other amendments uh, will be held on March 20th and March 28th from 7 to 8 p.m. So as last time, those sessions will be virtual and recorded and are a great opportunity to discuss uh, directly with the teams working on these initiatives. Um, but of course, I am happy to answer as many questions as I can, um, though I am not one of those working on this proposal directly. So if I can't answer you, I will take those questions back to that team. Uh, thank you so, so much. All right, so let's kick this to committee members for questions. Raise your hand if you have them. Alistair, you're up first. Hi, uh, th 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 thanks, Francesca, for your for the, um, the information you provided. There's a common link between your three pronged approach, um, and it's an unfortunate link, and that's the building department. DOB is linked to all three of those, and in my experience, it is the worst agency I have ever dealt with and everybody that I have known has dealt with in their entire lives practically. It is an agency of no's, I don't know, and silence. So your number one goal should be to fix the DOB because your three projects here are not gonna move forward without some kind of fix there. And they're, they're, all, they're all interlinked in a way. Um, so if you can focus on that, that'd be great on, on many, many levels. Um, Two, on the building efficiency, um, I, and, I, I, and I like all of your points, that it's, that I, I, I think they're all very good. I, I'll just tell you an, an instance we've had, which doesn't make sense. I don't know if you could do anything about it, but when we do the, um, the local law audits on, on our buildings, you know, the exact, they, they come in and, you know, the, the results are usually, oh, put, a, put a, a strip under the roof door to stop a draft. Um, you know, put some more insulation here. It's it's fairly insignificant changes to the building where nobody's focusing on the tenants in the building and their use of utilities. We 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 have the building, but the tenants are really running running the show with regards to how much uh, uh, power they're using, etc. And we can't control that. Uh, if they became stakeholders in this too, I think it'd be a lot more beneficial for everyone. For example, air conditioners in the windows. 
you walk around New York City, you see air conditioning in the, win in the windows all winter long. I know it's a pain to take them out, but the biggest draft you get, the biggest energy loss in a building is through the air conditioning in the window. It, it's, it's, it's absurd that we're trying to retrofit buildings and nothing's been done in, in the tenant's envelope that would benefit everybody. And, you know, people just aren't aware of it. It's, it's a hassle to take them out, et cetera. So if there's also hot water, most, most tenants don't pay for water. I've been in many apartments where I've seen hot water running all, all day long. Um, and that's just, the, the, that's how, what, how tenants have gotten used to, to doing things. Um, and it's, a matter of educating, having people responsible for things. So bringing the tenants in as stakeholders on all this, I think would render much better results and everybody working as a team. Um, solar canopy, I actually did a solar canopy up in Harlem on 474 West 150th uh, with success. I really, I, I liked it. The problem was it was very costly and I'm talking to my solar people and where they're gonna do the next projects with just having the solar panels lying on the roof, which isn't as beneficial because you can't get as much coverage. You got to leave access for uh, for um, uh, egress in case of a fire, et cetera. Uh, but it was quite costly. And I don't know if we're in a state to, con I'd love to do it because it was great, but we, we ran into some problems there. Um, and finally, I agree, we need more housing. That's the biggest issue in New York City um, that's driving up the cost of either if you wanna buy a house or if you wanna rent, rent an apartment, et cetera. So um, trying to uh, encourage more housing being built, I think would be fantastic for the city, for, for everyone involved. So anyway, thank you. The, 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 those are my comments, thanks. Alistair, thank you so much. Ooh, I've got a bit of an echo, so I apologize, but I just wanna say thank you so much. That was really, really helpful feedback with really great insights and examples. Um, I am so glad that you said that and we are taking notes and we will take this back to those teams. Um, but I do hope uh, because of your personal experience, especially with something like solar, that you do attend these info sessions that are coming up and speak directly with them because that will be really beneficial and I think they need to hear it. Um, in particular, when you talk about tenants, like I myself am someone who has lived with the beauties of New York City steam heat um, and just opening my windows in the wintertime. I know I, how insane some of this is. Um, so I really, really appreciate that. And, and it's really good feedback. Um, with regard to the expense of some of these initiatives, um, there were multiple programs, financing tools, initiatives, things like tax incentives uh, for retrofitting work all of which are um, available at the uh, state and federal level. Um, and actually there's really great personalized guidance um, on cost saving measures um, and you know energy upgrades and things through um, New York City Accelerator. So I don't know, Azka, uh, I will introduce my colleague Azka as well in case she wants to um, add anything uh, before we just take these comments back. But if Azka, you wouldn't mind dropping that link in the chat and uh, if you have anything to add. Uh, nope, appreciate the comments. Uh, I'll drop the link. Thank you. All right, um, Ariadna, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you for the presentation, very helpful. I had some clarifying questions under economic opportunity. Uh, for one of the examples that you spoke about, for example, the 15 minute grocery stores, that is something that I noticed pop up a lot on storefronts, specifically for luxury buildings that have these massive storefronts that remain empty for you know months and months at a time with no tenant to fill permanently. And I noticed that these uh, types of businesses do take up um, these storefronts for a couple of months. So was the example that you provided more about the visibility into these storefronts or is it prioritizing tenants or allowing for the zoning to encourage tenants that are more permanent and used for, pub for, for the public? Um, that's a really good question. And I think I understand you're sort of trying to balance almost like a programmatic angle through the zoning is that right like how are we targeting specific tenants uh or is this sort of more i mean i'll just say um we're we're trying to reduce impediments across a sort of holistic range um so we're trying to make it easier for different kinds of tenants to locate we're trying to make it clearer for um business owners to know where and where they can't locate um we're trying to make things more flexible um but this has not yet taken shape. Um, and so I I don't have as much guidance on that as I would like. Azka, do you have any further thoughts on that before we take this back? 
Yeah, um, I mean, again, like Francesca was saying, you know, sort of the, um, you know, what's the reason we are doing this, like one of the main reasons is because uh, the way that zoning, our zoning currently works, you know, each zoning district allows a certain number of uses uh, that are codified in our zoning resolution. Um, and a lot of these use groups and these uses have not been updated since, you know, the zoning resolution was first adopted in 1961. And a lot of business use has changed since then with, you know, upgrades to how businesses are run, how uh, a lot of the the technologies that have changed and improved. So sometimes there's we don't need to have such separation of uses uh, the way that they were thought of back in uh, you know 1961. So the goal for this um, economic opportunity initiative is to take a look at those zoning groups and see again which things don't make sense anymore and they're just kind of integrated in how they were thought of previously and allow uh, more commercial use across the city wherever they make sense. Sure, that makes sense. Thank you. And then just one final comment I had is for housing opportunity. You guys spoke a lot about uh, different rules about, you know, sizing and how many units have to be per floor and adding more flexibility to those kind of requirements. One concern I would have or something that I would hope to see is limits in uh, new high rises or new buildings that only see, you know, floor, uh, like one unit per floor, um, et cetera. So if that's something that could be incorporated, um, I would like uh, that. Um, that's a concern I'd have. Thank you. That's a great comment. And I think um, very much worth addressing with the uh, committee that's going to be working on this. And I have a feeling that that may be one that they have heard. Um, but please do bring it with you. And we will, of course, take it back to them. All right, Trevor. I thank you for that presentation. I did see a more detailed one or sat in on a group watching a more detailed one. So I know there are more details that you're not going to go through since this is just a brief presentation, but I will ask you, when do you, or when are you expecting comments from the community board, not from just members here, but from the community board? Great question. Um, my understanding is that once this is filed, we'll be welcoming those, um, you know, that feedback. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that will be in um, late April, um, but Ozka, is, am, have I got that right? So all three of these Stay zoning chain. initiatives are on different it's time. Got to move ahead. Sorry. See then. Um, sorry, someone is okay. Um, yeah, so all three of these initiatives are on different time uh, timelines. So the first one that's going to be, uh, you know, that's closest to being filed uh, officially, you know, and that kicks off that public review process with going to the community for resolutions and all that, which you're familiar with other with other citywide uh, is carbon neutrality, which, um, like Francesca said, uh, is tentatively scheduled for filing uh, late April. Um, and so after that is when it's going to be referred to the community board for official commenting. Uh, we're still a little ways off from the other two. Uh, economic opportunity, uh, we are expecting certification and filings sometime in the fall of this year, and then housing opportunity is expected to be uh, uh, filed sometime in the early next year. Okay, and just two quick comments or questions. Um, you mentioned a lot about electrical conversions and the buildings and changing the grid. And there's been plenty of stories that basically say that New York City can't handle the electrification process that we're all looking forward to. But my concern, because I know you can only give them a sentence and talk about you're limited as DCP, but I noticed that a lot of these, a lot of these, uh, uh, these types of infrastructure projects wind up in low income neighborhoods and some are still in low income neighborhoods, meaning the electrical uh, substation itself. They would obviously need to expand. And I know you're limited, but what I don't want to see is more of these plants or, or an electrical plant expanding which are primarily in low-income neighborhoods because we need to, um, you know, we need to up our, our, our infrastructure for electric because New York City will not be ready by 2050. Uh, they can't even, buildings can't even handle converting from gas stoves to electrical because a lot of electrics on the wall would take basically a demo to do that. Um, so I'm like, what do you, I, I know you have limitations at DCP, but what's your thinking on those, on those particular thoughts? That's a really good, sorry, go ahead, Aska, please. 
All right. Um, no, that's an excellent point. And, you know, like you like you say, sort of our limitations in being city planning and sort of the tools that are in our toolbox and we're, what we're trying to use to make sure that nothing in zoning uh, resolution is sort of in the way for, um, you know, clean energy, but separate from us. Uh, we know that Con Edison has committed to uh, building up an, a, an energy grid that delivers 100% clean energy by 2040. And, you know, you, you can read about their initiative on their commitment on their website. Um, they also had a, have a recent initiative to support their commitment, um, which is called Reliable Clean Energy um, Project, which will strengthen New York City's electric get, grid to use clean energy in the outer boroughs. Uh, again, another initiative that you can read on their website. Um, these aren't sort of our initiatives, but we're hoping that the changes that we're making and proposing through these, uh, you know, city planning will further support Con Ed's uh, efforts to expand the cleaner energy grid. And also, I'll just say thank you so much for sharing that with me as the liaison for this community. I take that very seriously. And the last thing, and that has to do with affordable apartments and the conversion. And a lot of affordable apartments can't can, can afford a lot of these changes. And there are some, but not a lot. And uh, sort of basically. Well, free money, but it's not free because you have to pay it back. But it's a there are grants and stuff. But a lot of it doesn't cover the cost for these buildings. I, I understand that DCP is limited, but are you working with your partners to give incentives and make it easier for affordable buildings uh, to to convert or to make themselves more carbon neutral? That is a question that I do not have the answer to, and is excellent. Um, Asuka, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I think, you know, beyond what, uh, Francesca, you mentioned earlier with um, NYC Accelerator being a source for that, um, I know that, you know, individual, you know, city is making efforts to make cleaner energy uh, and retrofitting their own buildings across the city. Um, but, you know, when it comes to affordable housing and other affordable uh, uh, buildings, we understand that that is the, uh, that, you know, the financial aspect of this is an impediment. Um, and, you know, we try wherever we can to advocate for more initiative, more incentives and things, but um, you know, uh, because none of this kind of works in silo, and we understand that. And like you know, our, our we, we in our capacity, we try to advocate as much as possible for uh, you know other init initiatives and incentives that the city can provide. Thank you. Thank you. Charlie. All right, Damaris, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, you guys, it took me a minute to find my microphone. So <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, ask uh, how this relates to the, and you might, I'm sure you're familiar with the five borough housing movement, which um, also is working at the state level to um, change the FAR rules um, in order to convert commercial properties to residential properties, et cetera. And so just to put an exclamation point behind part of what Trevor was talking about regarding, um, you know, uh, the demand, uh, you know, I, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, to what extent have you all considered and uh, what they're trying to do already at the state level and how that would relate to what you all are doing now? That is an excellent question. Thank you, Damaris. Um, I will just say that I think um, housing opportunity is the uh, initiative that is the furthest out and thus is the least splashed through. Um, I would say that we are working with all partners that we can and I, I'm not certain um, how those timelines will interact with regard to the state level conversations taking place around FAR. Um, but I will say that right now we are very limited in scope to reforming some seriously antiquated zoning. So um, while we do want these things to align, um, it is somewhat beyond the scope of what we're able to address um, just at DCP with this initiative, but we are mindful um, and these conversations are very much happening. Um, Aska, do you have any extra thoughts on this? No, I think you summarized it 
pre uh, pretty well. Uh, you know, definitely keeping an eye out on sort of the, all the political conversations, state level, local level, and you know, uh, that's happening around affordable housing um, and and anything we can do as a city to, uh, you know, um, to meet our goals. Especially, you know, with uh, this administration has reiterated multiple times their commitment to making sure that affordable housing is at the forefront and everything we think of in our, uh, you know, our policies. Um, so just uh, we're trying to see wherever we can, uh, you know, this again, like Francesca said, the housing uh, opportunity uh, initiative might not be that broad arching view of like fixing affordable housing, but you know, it's like whatever we can do and in every way we can taking those small steps that are just as needed, just as necessary to make sure that nothing in our existing zoning is preventing affordable housing from being getting built. And I'll I'll just, um, thank you, Aska, that was excellent. And I'll just um, add here, Damaris, I think that's, um, if there are specific examples within the community that concern you or something that might be elucidating, um, I would love to hear it certainly. And I know that the team working on this would also love to hear it. You are more than welcome to um, think through that if you'd like to send us any like case studies or articles. No, or I don't know. I mean, you, you should just you should just look up what it is that they're doing. Um, I don't need to send you all any examples. What they're doing is basically what I think you should look at in terms of um, you know, whatever uh, we think the outcome is going to be, because they are going to, there is going to be some, inter there's intersectionality there, that's all. That's all the, the, the only point I really want to make. Absolutely heard and very much respect that point, and we will be taking it back to that team. Thank you. All right, does anyone have any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I have uh, Herman, go ahead. Um, as one of the persons who's been around, this, especially this neighborhood for a long time, um, the initiative for housing or energy um, programs, I have heard many, many mayors and many people from the states and the different departments um, that comes up with programs like that, this. But it seems to just hang in the, the hair because housing, affordable housing and stuff, the only reason most of the, the communities in this neighborhood or decently where they are was because there were people in the city um, that work with community-based organizations. The people who really have their foot and the ground, so to speak, and know the people that either live or visit those neighborhoods. I mean, um, there's one item that comes up that you're talking about was like um, solar energy or stuff. Um, my organization, Interfaith Adaptive Building, way back in the 70s, installed solar energy and windmill. And Connecticut is probably reaping a lot from that, although they sued us because they said we were um, providing energy and we were not, they were the monopoly until until we, we won in circuit court that um, that we were entitled to produce energy because we were only su supplying it to the buildings that we that we own. And and so most of these things can only work working with either we also run a program uh, from the state called the weatherization program. That was a big fa factor. We uh, we do new windows. We supply energy ref refrigerators. Um, we do plumbing to reduce water wastage. Um, we work with senior citizens to to remove their air conditioners in the summer, and we have people go back and replace them 
during the, the winter, especially in the senior houses. So those programs have been around. Um, maybe a lot of people is not around that when those happen, but we produce those programs. We also um, remove um, equipment from basements that were not working properly and, and put them in the new buildings that we construct on the roof. So, you know, it, it, it takes more than just the city or the state saying that they would um, reorder the zoning stuff to, so we could progress for the future with energy savings and stuff. But the community organizations, which a lot of them is not around anymore because the city, the city pulled the programs that were meant to do what you are talking about and no longer funded them. So it fall by the wayside. So if it's going to happen again, it has to be something that doesn't change by administration. Because that's our problem. As another administration come, nobody follows up and it goes away. That's all I want to say. And thank you so much. I all I can say is I wholeheartedly feel you. Um, and this definitely this initiative zoning, you know, zoning is a blunt instrument, uh, and it definitely cannot do the work that the very important work that you're talking about in isolation. Um, we're aware of that we know that this is limited. Um, and I, I very, I mean, your concerns are near and dear to my heart. Um, and we will be taking it back in any opportunity within or outside of these proposals that I can find to further this, I will be passing that forward. But um, yeah, unfortunately for the scope of this particular project, you know, politics and administrations being what they are, there's only so much that we can address um, through through this one element. Um, but thank you. Um, Azka, did you wanna add to that? Yep. Okay. All right, any other questions? All right, hearing none, I have one quick question, but more suggestion, which is to the extent that you all are working with buildings um, on kind of a cohesive effort, uh, I think taking the housing opportunity, ZTA, uh, part and parcel with a look at the building code would be tremendously valuable. Often what I hear is that the things driving up the cost of building are not just that it is unlawful to build certain types of developments, but also that things like multiple points of egress uh, or the, the uh, lack of point access blocks uh, makes it much more expensive to build. So I know this is just like common knowledge in the DCP community, I'm sure, but to the extent that you can hear from us, or at least from me, that uh, looking at the building code could also be helpful in furthering these goals. Um, yeah. Absolutely. We are, um, I for all that I appreciate concerns raised about the Department of Buildings, we are working in partnership with these agencies. Um, so we are, these conversations are happening. Um, and uh, again, we're taking notes, copious notes tonight, and we'll be sure to pass that along. All right, great. Well, Francesca, Aska, thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, and we will hear from the both of you, it sounds like relatively soon, uh, with this carbon neutrality ZTA as it, as it works its way through the process. Um, so great having you. Um, and I'm going to take away your ability to screen share and move on to the next item on our agenda which is the 70 Mulberry Street. Um, and so in order to do that, I'm going to promote some people to panelists. Uh, at this time as well, uh, I'm going to be enabling the interpretation feature on Zoom. If you are more comfortable hearing this presentation in either Mandarin or Cantonese, uh, you will be able to do that momentarily. Uh, you can see at the bottom of your 
screen a language. Jake, somebody okay. should say that in Mandarin and Cantonese. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, I, Jake, we actually have a slide um, where perfect. people speak it in English and Cantonese and Mandarin, and then you can start the interpretation. Perfect. Let's do that. Um, do English and. All right, Priyanka, would you like me to make you a co-host to share? Who should share that slide? Yo, you will share these slides, but just do not assign um, Renee and Chloe the interpretation yet. They will speak in this room in Cantonese and Mandarin just to show how the interpretation works, and then we'll start the interpretation. So, I understand. Yeah. All right. So, um, we are, I'll promote Roberto to panelist. All right. Well, I, I don't have that slide. So, who's going to share that? It's Yo Yo. Did you add her to the panelist? I think she's yo you she has raised her hand if you can add her. Yeah. Oh, I see her. Yeah. Yes. All and right. yeah, make her a co-host so she can start sharing her screen. Thank you. Hi, Jake. Can you also make Jerome Alas as a panelist? Um yes, I can. All right, yo you, you're a co-host, so you can share your screen now. Hi everyone, I'm going to sh share my screen. And before, uh, while I share screen, uh, Duran, do you want to say a few words uh, before I, we start Actually, the presentation? I, I was going to, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Norberto Acevedo. I'm the director of DDC's Office of Community Outreach Notification. I apologize, my uh, camera's not on. Uh, this is home Wi-Fi, and I run into issues sometimes. So I didn't want to drop off the meeting. Um, but I just like to uh, say that yes, uh, Department of Design and Construction is managing the uh, project at 70 Mulberry, and we have here tonight uh, some members of of my team at uh, DDC, other colleagues uh, that are helping manage this program, as well as our consultant designers. And as we move forward, um, we have our project manager Jerome, who I'm gonna. Let introduce uh, the rest of the team and the consultant as well. Hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, uh, I am the project manager for the Sony Mulberry Street reconstruction project with the uh, NYC Department of Design and Construction, uh, joined by uh, co project manager Midori Tanabe and assistant commissioner Juan Cuervo. Um, for the uh, 70 Mulberry Street reconstruction project, the uh, project team has completed the initial schematic design phase at the end of February, and uh, we're very excited to present the preferred scheme to you all. Um, the scheme keeps the promises uh, made to the community. Jerome, I'm uh, sorry to interrupt you. Do sorry, we want to ahead. get the interpretation started first before we start going into the contents of the presentation? Um, Priyanka, could you uh, help out here? We haven't started the presentation yet. Uh, Jerome, if you want to give a quick intro to yourself, uh, but then wait for um, the Samuel's in uh, interpretation, maybe Chloe can also introduce you, but just stop after a sentence and then we'll switch to the presentation, which is when the interpretation will start. Okay. Uh, so I can, I'll just hand it off to Grimshaw uh, right now. Thank you. Uh, Yo-Yu, please. Hi, everyone. Um, we have language interpretation enabled for this meeting. So right after this slide, once it got uh, enabled, you will see an interpretation button on the control panel. So you can click the interpretation in the meeting control. And then uh, next to the listening in, click the drop down menu, select the audio channel you want to listen to. Then you uh, enable the language interpretation function. 
嗨，大家好，我们现在介绍如何使用粤语和普通话的翻译。那么我们为本次的会议启用了翻译，如需使用普通话或粤语的实时翻译，请参阅以下说明和平面的屏幕的截图。请点击会议控制中心的 Interpretation 口译，然后再点击 Listening 收听旁边的下拉菜单，最后选择要收听的音频频道，你就可以收听了。系、hey, 大家好，我哋咧为咗本次嘅会议，佢用咗翻译。如果有需要用普通话或者粤语嘅时事嘅翻译，请参与以下熟面同视频嘅在途。第一就系点击会议嘅控制中心嘅 interpretation 口译。第二咧，你就点制点击咗 listen in， 即系收听旁边嗰个下拉嘅菜单。第三咧就選擇收聽嘅音頻嘅頻道。Jack, please start the interpretation function. All right, it should be started. Um, hello, everyone. This is Yo Yu Chen of Grimshaw Architects. I'm the project architect for 70 Mulberry. It's a great pleasure to join the CV3 meeting today. Uh, the 70 Mulberry Street uh, is a critical community asset. We completed the schematic design at the end of February and are very excited to share the project update with you. We are in the early phase of design and the content we share today is work in progress and we will keep developing it in the coming month. As uh, some of you met three by three in the community visioning process, we have three by three uh, join the design team. And here is the uh, community engagement milestone. So uh, back in September 2020, uh, there's a DCAS has a community visioning process. November 2021, uh, DDC and DCAS uh, had a brief and budget to rebuild the 70 Mulberry Street. And the Grimshaw, uh, we joined the design, we started the design in August 2022. Uh, we met with the CB3 uh, last September. And for the past month, um, we started the DCLA uh, artist selection panel and uh, completed the schematic design and uh, shared the result with, I uh, shared the delivery with five tenants. And uh, this earlier this month, uh, we met with the advisory group. And today uh, we are meeting with you, uh, CB3, CB uh, all the members. And below are the up and coming community engagement. Uh, this month, we are going to uh, meet with the PDC uh, conceptual review presentation. And um, we will further uh, select the artist for this project with DCLA. And in April or May, the, we are going to have a public community engagement uh, event. It will be both in person and the virtual. Um, and lastly, in May, uh, we are going to um, have a PDC preliminary presentation. Um, And uh, as mentioned earlier, the uh, the schematic design meet all of the project scope requirements, and then we like to share with you the project scope. Uh, the first is to um, preserve and restore portion of the existing historic facade. It is vital to retain the building's identity through what can be saved of the facade. The basis of the design intent is to preserve the remaining two-story street facade and six-story stair tower facade. Uh, geotechnical information and construction managers input are required to verify the technical strategy and cost. Uh, uh, secondly, we will uh, uh, we will return 51,000 square feet uh, to the previous tenant institution. Uh, 
uh, we will restore the five resident institutions back to their home. Uh, we examine the program requirements and we are proposing refinement to better serve each organization. The new design will support both individual cultural identity as well as overlapping interaction between the organizations under one roof. Uh, there will be um, additional 16,500 square feet community spaces and offices in the building, uh, including a multi-purpose room for gallery or physical fitness and recreation spaces. Um, the new building uh, will provide three elevators and three egress stairs uh, for code compliance and accessibility. Um, uh, let's share the project timeline. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the project team, the design kickoff uh, last August, and we are about six months into the design phase. Um, we will keep the keep developing the design in the coming months. Uh, and the design you see today is subject to change as we refine the, uh, the plans. And then the projected substantial completion of this project is end of 2027. Uh, 70 Mulberry is a historic landmark with memories of generations uh, designed and operate as a public school in the late 1800. Um, an additional floor was added that dramatically changed the look of the building with the stair tower losing its prominence. In the more recent history, the five-story red brick building was home to uh, nonprofit community groups and served as an anchor to its community. Uh, in January 2020, 70 Mulberry Street was severely damaged by a fire that destroyed the top of three, three floors and displaced its five tenants. Uh, 70 Mulberry Street is a unique and beloved community space. The, the proposed design at the right is a six-story building with level six setback from the street. It emphasizes the stair tower as the Snyder original design. The, the project site is at the heart of Chinatown in Manhattan, New York City, conveniently located near major subway lines, bus routes, and the city bike dock. It's surrounded by bustling street filled with shops, restaurants, and other attractions with many visitors and the food traffic. Uh, 70 Mulberry Street is right across from the Columbus Park. The park serves a gallery space for residents of Chinatown. It's not only provide a space for socializing, playing games, and the practicing Tai Chi, but it is also a peaceful oasis in the midst of the city's hustle and bustle. Um, the current condition um, was a two-story uh, street facade and the six-story stair tower uh, facade. Visually, uh, the remaining facades are in decent shape. And we can see there's a stoop uh, and the egress stairs are protruding to the pedestrian. And uh, they, there are no street trees uh, at the pedestrian. Uh, the proposed massing strategy is a six-story uh, building. Level six is a double high space with 20 feet setback uh, from the street facade. The, the massing strategy will make the stair tower prominent as the original Snyder design. The new design will remove stoop and eager stairs protruding in the pedestrian and provide a better connection with, with street views. Um, this is a schematic design rendering of the proposed massing. And this is the view from the Columbus Park. The stair tower contribute to the architecture character. Uh, the new street trees um, echoes and extend the greenery and the calmness of Columbus Park. Uh, trees are proposed um, planted on the terrace level 
uh, the, the the design intent is to uh, distinguish the new and the, the old envelope. Um, another view from Bear Street, look east. Uh, the new entrance will be located next to the stair tower along the Mulberry Street. Um, we like to share the approach experience of the proposed design. It is in the early design phase and the animation uh, shows the volume and the mass of the space without materiality and details. Removing the stoop and extending the window allows a better connection between the building and the pedestrian. Uh, the visitors will enter the building from the new Mulberry entrance next to the stair tower. After passing the vestibule, at the, the left hand side is the security and building surface area. At the right hand is the two story uh, lobby area. Along the Bayer Street a corner, this is the two uh, community space for the community and for the tenant. The double height lobby uh, has M facing south along the Bayer Street. Uh, with abundant daylight and then have a great uh, connection with level two um, um, second floor area. Uh, here is a view from the two story lobby uh, to the stair tower. Uh, the lobby will showcase the the remaining existing uh, facade along the Bear Street and provide a visual connection uh, with level two. The stair tower uh, serve as a place for people to meet, it, meet each other and socialize in the past uh, to honor the, the community's memories. We decided to keep the stair tower as one of the main uh, vertical circulation. A new staircase will be installed um, and the skylight uh, will be added to provide natural light on top. Um, we plan to feature two art pieces, one in the lobby and another in the stair tower. Our design team is collaborating with an artist to create an integrated artwork that is um, authentic and specific for 70 Mulberry Street. Um, we, we like to uh, walk you through the plans first. Uh, this is the proposed site plan showing the newly planted uh, street trees, uh, three along Mulberry and three along Bayer Street. It will provide a better pedestrian experience. Uh, the, the main entrance will be at the Mulberry Street next to the stair tower. Three elevators, um, will be installed to enhance the accessibility. The elevator at the south is a swing elevator for freight and the passenger use. A service corridor um, directly connected to the Bear Street and the freight elevator. Uh, the back of house circulation uh, and the visitor circulation will be separated uh, to meet the contemporary building service standards. Uh, passing through the vestibule is the security and the building services area at the left, and then the double high lobby at the right uh, along the Bayer Street. Um, a community room is located at the corner um, facing the two story lobby. This is prime location, it's reserved uh, for the community to use. It's visible. Uh, from the ground floor and the easy access. Um, the master green, the master yellow color you see on the plan is indicate the shared, uh, shared community space uh, for the community and the tenant. And then talk about a little bit about the tenant. Uh, the senior citizen, they used to occupy the whole floor, whole ground floor uh, with the new lobby and elevators. The senior centers uh, were split into two floor cafeteria and the kitchen were located at ground floor and the activity rooms and the other classrooms are located on the second floor. Um, the 
kitchen will have direct access along the Mulberry Street uh, for delivery. And on the second floor, this is the community, another community room overlooking the double high space. Um, Museum of Chinese in America, and then the senior citizen centers. Um, and there's one, a building service office located on the second floor. Um, two more uh, shared office uh, for the community and the tenant are on the third floor, as you see here in the mustard yellow color. Um, three tenants uh, provide services on the um, on the third floor. It's uh, the red is the Chan Dance Center. Uh, the purple is the United East Athletic Association and the uh, uh, Chinatown Manpower Project um, along the corner, um, along facing the Bear Street. On level four and level five, it's a uh, it's occupied by the Chinatown Manpower Project. Uh, this is level four and then level five. Um, we like to share the multi-purpose, uh, double high multi-purpose space uh, located at level six. Uh, it has 20 feet setback from the property line and trees will be planted for shading and the occupancy control. The Level six can accommodate up to 500 occupancies. A rooftop terrace at this location is truly unique. It's overlooking the Columbus Park is one of the kind. Uh, the multipurpose room will be open to the public and tenant. It will be a gem for the community to serve all kinds of events, community galleries, press releases, job affairs, fundraising, galas, sports, and the recreation, et cetera, event. Um, a mezzanine above level six will support the multi-purpose room. It provides storage and the fabrication a function with a freight elevator access. Um, looking at the mechanical roof, um, all the mechanical equipment is uh, is placing along the north and east property line, um, green roof and the PV panels facing the uh, close to the terrace facing Mulberry and the Bear Street. Um, lastly, um, this is the cellar plan. A, a portion of building support areas are located in the cellar uh, to maximize the building services for the community, bike storage, uh, locker rooms uh, and the showers are uh, located in the cellar. Uh, tenant staff and the members can access um, bike facilities through a staircase or elevator. Um, we are in the early phase of the design and we'll keep refining the plans and design um, in the coming months. Um, li like uh, Duran and the Nobordo say earlier, we are very excited to share the project update uh, with community board and you, um, and looking forward to hear your feedback. Um, here is the contact information, and thank you for taking the time to join the meeting and share your comments. Yes, so I'd like to thank the community board again. And uh, this is our contact information going uh, outside of this meeting, of course. Uh, if anyone has questions of, as we, <clears throat> excuse me, go through the design process, you can certainly reach out to us and we're here to answer questions. So um, please take over. Thank you all. Priyanka, would you like me to disable uh, interpretation now? And interpretation on this. All right. Um, interpreters, thank you very much uh, for your assistance. I believe you'll stay on to do serial interpretation as needed. Uh, yes. Members of the committee, do you have questions for the DDC or DCAS teams here?
All right. Seeing none, we're going to move on to members of the public. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, you can raise your hand and I will temporarily promote you to panelist uh, to speak. Um, so we're going to start with Alan Lee. Uh, could we stop the screen share, please? All right. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm sorry. Uh, this is Ian Allen. This is Jenny Yu. I'm just using this phone. And, but I am from the uh, United East, uh, one of the five tenants that um, operated out of the uh, Mulberry. And I just want to thank the design team for considering our program needs and including many of our suggestions in your plan. Thank you so much. Um, but I also wanted to uh, let CB3 members know that um, originally the UEAA AA, uh, space had a mezzanine for our office and um, file cabinets and storage for our day to day program. But um, in I'm the sorry, there's, there's a lot of feedback. I don't know if anyone else is hearing yeah. that. Yeah, I'm hearing it. So I'm just going to say something. I'm sorry. Let me, um, okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, can, is this better? Can everyone hear me better? Hello? Yes, that's a little bit better. We is there's just right? a lot of background noise. If if sorry you go that. ahead, just speak loudly, and we'll hopefully be able to hear you. Sure, sure. Um, sorry about that. So. Yes, uh, as I mentioned, I am a member of United East Athletics Association. We're one of the five tenants. Um, I just wanted to thank the design team for considering our needs, meeting with us, and including a lot of the suggestions that we um, that we offered. Uh, and you know, I just we just wanted to let the CP3 members know that uh, originally the UEA uh, headquarters space had a mezzanine. Uh, that we use for Alan, I think we lost you. Not Alan, but whoever has Alan's phone. All right, I think we're going to move on. Um, we can try again a little bit. I am now going to be promoting Carlin Chen. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Carlin. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank the design team for sharing this uh, very initial uh, design concept. I have a question regarding the the the, the Mulberry and the Bayer Street side, the upper floors above the second floor. Uh, it, it appears that you have some kind of a slat there. Wouldn't that take away from the natural sunlight going into the the spaces uh, along Mulberry and Bayard? Um, hi, hi, Carlin. Thank you for your questions. Um, we are we are doing we are in this is our concept design, and we are doing the thorough energy analysis to to make sure it's not blocking the daylight, but it's that can provide adequate shading uh, for the south facing facade. We have been a uh, conduct conduct a series of the energy analysis, but, but you are correct. I think for us, we are finding the balance of, of the energy, like efficiency and the provide shading comfort, but at the same time about the, the daylight and the views from the inside. But we, we are looking at this at the moment. Okay, I have another concern regarding the slatting, the layering. Uh, I, I think it looks a little out of context with the neighborhood. In plain windows would be nice. Okay, that's duly noted. Um, we'll certainly make sure the greater team hears that. 
All right, thank you, Carlin. I am making you an attendee and I'm promoting um, CN to panelist. All right, go ahead. Sorry, I just, uh, thank you for having me and thank you for this very detailed um, design concept and I'm happy that the community is invited to participate. Um, just very simple questions. Um, I, I understand that for the third floor, I believe, um, you sh you know you show some schematics. I wasn't sure exactly, um, but one is um, how were the square footage determined for each of the tenants, and uh, what is the square footage for Mocha the museum? And I didn't actually see it uh, on your scheme. Yes, hi, hi. Um, see how we uh, as the uh, as the commitment, it's a, it's a similar square footage as the tenant what they have on their lease. So that's kind of part of the pro project requirement. So the tenant are receive the program area as they used to have. I see. Um, and and uh, so so the the Mocha space is on the third floor. Is that right? If I remember correctly. Okay. I see. Um, and I, I see that there are a lot of community spaces uh, that are dedicated, open to the public. Um, and, uh, who and how will those community spaces be open to the public? I, do you know that? Or I, I know you're just simply designing the space. I'm not sure if you would know. I'm sorry, uh, the question was, which area of the building is open to the public? I'm sorry. No, no. I see that there are spaces that are open to the public. And since I am the public, right, uh, you know, I'm just wondering how will I have access to those spaces? Um, is it, you know what I mean? And, and because that, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of spaces that the design is saying is available to the public. Sure. And I think um, obviously the the whole building is filled with uh, the tenants uh, of various sorts, and the community uses those uh, services. the The building is going to be a secure building, of course. Uh, if DCAS is on the line, they could certainly speak to that. Um, is there like a specific yep. kind of design question? Or go ahead, Joe, if you want to jump in on that part. Yeah, no, but I could take that question. Absolutely. Um, it's a very it's a very valid question. It's part of the commitment. We were making part of the building available to the community. Now the community is asking how they're going to use it. DCAS plans on implementing a reservation system so that members of the community can come to DCAS through the system and then reserve portions of the space for their events or ongoing events. So we haven't we haven't created that system yet, but we plan on it being on a first come first serve reservation system. Okay, um, and is that something that is open for the public to participate in developing yes. as well? Oh, okay. it, it, well, the, the community will be, you know, welcome to use this the space through the reservation system. If you have co comments on how we do that, I'm sure we'll be open to that. Uh, it's a little early to discuss and finalize that, that system, right. but we'll, we'll be planning some. And, and if you have comments, we'll, of course, be listening. Okay, great. Thank you. Welcome. All right, I am going to send you back to the attendee section and I'm promoting Yin K um, to be a panelist. Hi everyone. Um, Yin here, director of Think Chinatown and also a resident. I don't live too far away from the building in question. Um, first, I got to say, I agree with Carlin about the slatting, just for a note for the design team. Um, second, I think the parking and pedestrian study needs to be expanded to include the impacts that we feel from the jail. So I think you need to include a few more blocks to the west for that study to be effective. Um, third is a study that I've already asked for several times um, for through DCAS and DDC which is a massing study for the maximum 
allowed um, floor area ratio from the current zoning. Uh, I understand this is not built to the maximum. I'm not saying that we should, I'm just saying that we haven't as the community seen um, these studies to understand why it's not being built to the maximum. Um, I heard in the previous meeting of something about the budget, but I also wanna bring up to the question of, is that really um, help? Uh, it should be press that further and understand how this can be overcome to um, meet our community needs. In our previous engagements um, process with three by three, we really heard that we need more community space. And I see that through your scheme here that there is um, some more community space, but it seems like it's a, a com communal lounge kind of preservable space. Um, there isn't mention of something that was brought up in the um, visioning session, which was having an open cultural welcome center for the for visitors in the community to have access to. Um, I don't see anything about having space for a new generation of nonprofits that um, very direly need space in the community. Um, these were all mentioned in the visioning session three by three ran previously, and I don't see them addressed at the moment. Um, I've been asking these questions a lot to GDC and DCAS. Um, I haven't heard any responses yet. So I'd love to hear, um, hear from them now. Thank you. So I think uh, you first, you, you talked about budget, correct? And yes, this is a project that like every project that comes through DDC to manage, it has a budget. So all that is established very early um, for this project, it's no different. So this design is designed to the budget we were given. Now along uh, the process of designing and constructing, uh, constructing this building, um, there will almost certainly, it's a very complicated process for any building, certainly be uh, change orders or things of that nature as you move along, unforeseen conditions, things of that sort. Uh, but the design or the, the, the total project is designed to budget. Um, not much more to say on that matter. Um, the, the other parts, I'm sorry, can you repeat the, the last couple of items you had there? Sure. The other was about the parking and pedestrian study, how that needs to include more to the West, include the jail construction. Okay. Um, we'll have to, yeah, I'm not familiar with that um, as much as the jail, uh, as far as what's very big project that's happening at us. That's right next door. So I think. Oh, no, I, I know the borough based jails. That's yeah. One of our, our, uh, large, uh, it is the largest project that DDC uh -huh. has in its portfolio, so very aware of it, and I'm active on that project too. The construction timeline should be coinciding, so I yeah, think they, the study they, needs to be made. Yeah, both these projects uh, actually, yes, are happening uh, technically at the same time. Yes, yeah, so and the really, study yes. should include both. Yeah. So we'll let me check back with my DDC uh, colleagues in our program unit. Great. I'd love to see, see the study have. at the next community board meeting. I think that would be great. On the other elements were um, the cultural welcome center that we were talking about during the visioning session and space for new generations of nonprofits. I don't see them in this scheme. Any of our colleagues in design um, want to speak to any depth to that? So what we could do is just revisit what it was that you're, you're talking about early on when the three by three did visioning sessions with DCAS and the mayor's office, right? Correct. Yeah, we all spent Correct. a lot of time contributing to that and I'm not seeing anything back from that. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look at what we have um, there that the information that we received from uh, that initial community engagement and visioning section, session was certainly part of this process. So 
I'm not exactly sure what you're missing, but we could certainly look. Can I, uh, if I may address um, that partly, not fully, uh, we'll definitely come back with a more comprehensive response, but I think we had a lot that we gained from the community visioning process and feedback. We certainly did a good job of documenting all that was asked. Um, the design does address a large part of it in terms of both small and big community spaces. There is also person to art program that will integrate into it to create other spaces that were asked in terms of experience. But um, if they are specific uh, asks such as Open Cultural Welcome Center, um, I think the space for new generation of nonprofits is addressed through the communal rooms, which can be a reserve to a reservation system. No, and I, I don't. Uh, okay. And uh, for the cultural welcome center is something that we'll have to get back to you. Yeah, I just felt like we spent a lot of time as a community contributing to that visioning. And I really don't see a lot coming back through this initial design. And maybe this is a comment to the community board and not to DDC, but you know, we've went through this process before and we've identified a lot of community needs. Maybe we should be exploring ways to you know, get a budget that can really use this opportunity to fill, fulfill these community needs rather than let DDC tell us, you know, what we can or cannot have. Um, I, I, I find, I, I'm, I'm, the, the design is beautiful. Thank you, Grimshaw, but I, I feel um, there is a bit lacking in, you know, everything that we went through the visioning process. So I look forward to seeing how this can be addressed in the future. And I hope uh, the community board uh, can share on how they feel on that as well. Thank you. I'm going to demote you to you demote yourself to panelist. Okay. Um, next up, I'm going to promote C H Sin to panelist. Oh no, there you are. Sorry, Miss K. All right. Go ahead. Oh, hi. Um, my name is uh, Chong Sin, and I uh, represent United East Athletic Association. And I just try to uh, emphasize, uh, try to continue what Ella tried to say, and she got disconnected before. And what we're trying to say is, originally, our UEA had a messaging that, that, uh, uh, that used for our you know, office space. So I just want to make sure that uh, this uh, still uh, in you uh, in in, in, you, uh, in the plan, so that we will not lose the office space because you can see that UEA had a very small area to provide service for the community. Anyone can uh, make sure that still in plan. You, you guys hear what I say? Uh, yes, we hear you. Um, and I would like to defer to the design team to address that uh, issue for the uh, mezzanine. Hi, hi, Shin. Thank, thank you for your feedback. We, we are like aware of, of your space requirement and you used to have a mezzanine. We are working very hard with our co-consultant. We want to ensure it, it's meet up meet, meet the current code, and uh, we are working on that. Ho hopefully, we can uh, share some updates with you soon. But because you know it's a new building, we have to meet the the all the current code requirements, like either the accessibility for the handicap member you have, and then also the egress, how people safely discharge when there is a fire from mezzanine. So we 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 will understand your request, and then. We, we are working with our co-consultant to, to, to make sure we, we can respond to that and then meet all the building code and accessibility requirement. Thank you. All right. So, you know, I mean, if it is, uh, uh, you know, if it is not possible or, you know, uh, hopefully it is possible, but, you know, we just hope that if, the, you know, we can utilize the office that, you know, I can see on the on the map that we can use it as an office area also. 
All right, thank you. I'm going to change you to an attendee and I'm going to promote May to a panelist. Hello, welcome May. Uh, hi there. Um, so I have a question, um, not so much about the design of the space, but um, the use of it, particularly the community rooms. Um, not the ones that are, you know, that are within the non the, the five nonprofits, but the ones that are outside of it. And I'm not familiar with um, when a city agency um, controls the the use of the room through a reservation system. So could you explain that more? Um, is there like a fee to use the community rooms, or is it free because it's owned by the city? And then. Is this sort of like we work? We just kind of make a reservation, or you know, or is there some kind of criterion? I'm familiar with the New York City Department of, of Education and the public schools, you know, so they have a thing, but you know, there it's not just the reservation system. So if you could explain a little bit more yep. or give another example, that would be good. Well, I, I could certainly answer that question. So the building's being designed with a commitment to the community in mind, right? So the community can come to this building. It could be a gem in Chinatown. The community can feel welcome there and utilize the space. As far as the reservation system and the other point you pointed out, that's still in, it's still premature and we're still thinking about ways of making it as seamless and as helpful to the community as possible. It will be something controlled by or run by DCAS where it can be equitable for the community to come in and use the space. So I don't have details on that reservation space yet. The building's still several years away from being built, but we will be working on that. We will also make sure that there's advertisements so the community knows where to come and we'll make it accessible to people and the community and make it as simple as possible. And my other question is that is about, is there a charge for it? That I, I haven't had discussions about whether there's a charge now, but you could, if there's a 500, person gallery on the top floor, I could assume that there certainly might be some sort of, maybe, maybe not something for the city to make a profit on, but at least to cover costs. That's me speaking. We haven't had those discussions in depth yet. But when okay, we do, so have we will done, no. yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, so my question is, have you done this somewhere else? Or? Um, have We have not done this somewhere else. Um, I do have different programs where the city allows uh, members of the public to uh, enter into a license agreement to use DCAS shared spaces such as lobbies and other other areas in public buildings. It, it could be similar to that, but this would be more community oriented and more community friendly than those. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, May. I'm going to send you back to the attendees and I'm going to promote uh, Coma Coma as a panelist. Here we go. All right, go ahead. Hello? We can hear you, go ahead. Jay Kumakuma also has questions in the chat. Maybe we can just. Sure, I think it's probably better if if uh, the, he just speaks. Sir, if you unmute your microphone. Um... We can't hear you. Can you unmute your microphone? Okay, can yeah. you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Okay, my name is uh, Victor Huey from an organization called Chinatown Organization for Media Awakening, aka COMA. We're op we've been operating a community center out of 21 Pell, an, a church. Um, I've been a resident of Chinatown for over 100, you know, I mean, I'm 72, but I've been here for 72 years, and the uh, building that we have is been there for a hundred years. Um, the community center on Mott Street, CCBA, was funded totally by 
between city and some local people. And most of Chinatown has always funded its own organization stuff from internal because we didn't ask money from the city. But since the pandemic and um, what's been happening to our community, you know, we need help. And, and, we're, and we're at a generation now that we, we're beginning to start to ask for help. Now this building, this plot, it's a large plot in Chinatown. We very rare to have the opportunity to create a community center for all, not a club, not a special interest group, but for all the residents of Chinatown. And most importantly, we need a community center. We used to have a gym at, um, at the uh, CCBA, but they closed it. We need a theater. We need a place for the new organizations to have a place to exist. Chinatown has taken a lot of hits over the last, since 9-11. And we don't have any say in how buildings are being built, jails are being built. And a lot of people are getting frustrated that is it possible that we have input into this building? You say you run out of money, you can't build it anymore. I think we could raise more money. The community would love to have a, because Chinatown, New York, is like Harlem. It's the cultural center of all the Chinese in, in New York City. Maybe we don't live here as much like we used to, but still it's the cultural center of the New York Chinatowns. And you have to respect that. It's not some kind of building that you guys just plop in, whether it's a, a sculpt, dog man sculpture or that is out of, out of um, character with the neighborhood. The neighborhood has special needs. We need to get our community center to address the community needs. And the community has many needs right now. With anti-Asian hate, not enough people talking about our history that we've been here for 150 years in Chinatown. We served in the military, but nobody knows about our history or our contributions to the city. And yet we are dictated, oh, you need this, or we you need a jail, or you need this, but we don't have our input. And then when we go to these meetings, we get the usual blah, blah, blah. Well, how about having community input? Well, we can invest in our own community where people can say, okay, you don't have money for a gym? We'll raise the money. You don't have money for a theater? We'll raise the theater. They do it in Vancouver. They do it in Philly. It's time for us to wake up and you to listen to our needs. All right, thank you. Uh, DDC or DCAST, does anyone have, have anything that they'd like to respond? No, no response. Um, we are certainly here uh, to work with the community. I hope no one on this call or in the community thinks we're not. Um, you, you raised some very important uh, points and uh, from our perspective, we're, we're doing everything that we can with the, the tools that we have as an agency to manage this process. Um, so we work with our budgets, we work within the parameters and guidelines of uh, the municipalities and uh, all the regulations and local laws we have to uh, abide by. Uh, and that is the Department of Design and Construction. So I can only speak for our agency. Yeah, but like, you know, the initial response when the building got burnt down, instead of doing the proper fire uh, inspection, you know, there was a five alarm fire fully engaged with a homeless person inside. Nobody found out whether the was arson involved. Quick to, the, to, to take down the top three floors while the building is structurally with steel girders inside. That building was sound. They built that for 100 years or less than 200 years. But what was the rush to, to take the building down? What, you want to make a parking lot? No. We didn't have a say in what was happening with the building. The city just moved, took down the floors until we demonstrated to stop 
the destruction of, that's why you have that base, because we fought for it. We fought to make sure that you didn't tear it down without our say so. And we can participate and help build this building. You think that we don't want to, we don't care about our own community, that we can't raise the money? Stop thinking in your little box. Chinatown is a vital part of New York City. It's the cultural center of Chinatowns in the East Coast. Our stories need to be told and our history has to be understood. We've been here for 150 years and we need to have that recognized. Right. Thank you very much. I'm going to send you back to the attendees. I appreciate you taking the time to, to share your thoughts. I'm going to promote Amy Chin to panelist. And before that, I have one clarifying question in the chat from Yin. Uh, is there any space in the scheme for a permanent nonprofit space rather than the WeWork style communal space? I would have to defer to Joe at DCAS on that. Yeah, as of, as of now, the building was built consistent with the commitment that the city made, right? Rebuild the building, restore the five tenants, and provide an X amount of um, square footage for communal space. That's the way the building is built. I don't think there's any plans to add any new tenants. All right. Uh, thank you both. Ms. Chin, go ahead. Hi. Um, uh, the last time that there was a report back, um, I had asked this question about what was the maximum FAR that could be built. And because we were told that this isn't being built to the maximum FAR and um, uh, the community needs a lot of space. Um, I agree that um, you know there are budgetary concerns, but at that last meeting, I had asked how much more could be built because there's so much need. And I'm not talking about communal space, I'm talking about dedicated space. In the last 10 and 20 years, dozens and dozens of Chinatown groups have disappeared because they've lost their space. Um, and at that last report back, I was told that the architects would go back and do an analysis because the limitations to building to the full FAR or building more community space was budgetary and also sky plate exposure. So I haven't gotten an answer back um, about uh, how much more could be built and how much more is needed, because if it is budgetary, then we can raise the money, we can get more allocations. I worry that a lot of the community engagement that we have been engaged in is really a cover sometimes. So you can say, oh, we talked to the community and they told us X, Y, Z, and then you come back with designs that really don't address what the community has expressed. You know, as a community that's been neglected and now being assaulted by this massive jail and construction and really has is really under assault on many different fronts. Um, I think it's really important to really think about what the needs are and how come communities like ours are disappearing due to neglect, due to underfunding and due to an unresponsiveness generally to us when we say this is what we need. So, um, you know, my one basic question is how much more can be built? How much more does it cost? Let's do it. No answers? <laughs> Sorry, I, I was <laughs> uh, just looking for a question there. Um, I understand what you're saying. I can comprehend it. Um, but again, you know, this is not just a line that I'm, I'm feeding the community. We have to work within the budget and scope of work that we have. Uh, so well, I, I, while you are I correct, that. yeah, you, uh, while you are correct in that um, there's more allowable space uh, to build within, uh, we just do not have the budget to do that and also uh, keep up with the other commitments that were made for this building. 
So that that was perhaps, the answer that that was the answer that was given last time in December when we asked the same question. And the response back then was that next time we meet, the architects will show us how much more can be built and how much it would cost. And I still don't have an answer. And I know that okay. you have a budget, but budgets are also flexible, right? At one point when the fire happened, there was no money to rebuild. And then there was 20 million. And then there was 180 million. Um, so again, budgets are, you know, can be anything. It just has to be allocated. And if we have the political will and we have the desire, we should be able to get it done and get something built that the community really needs. Not just rebuild back what was there, but really build something that is going to change the game for the community. A community that has been neglected for so long and is in crisis. So how much and how tall? That's, that, that, that is the question I've been asking since this summer. Yeah, there, we do not have that answer here. Uh, and I don't think that's an answer we could possibly give under the parameters that we have. Um, we are managing a process of, of a current scope of work with a current budget um, for beyond this uh, to, to build in a space uh, or, or match the needs of the community perhaps would be a, a different project or a, a, a different uh, path. But for what we are here for today is just for this scope of work. And uh, we are bringing that to the community and trying to hope uh, that we are matching the commitments that were made. Like I said, we have a, a space that was uh, being utilized by uh, several uh, community tenants. And that's certainly what we're giving back and actually a little bit more uh, square footage wise. And there is also a, a, a community space uh, in this building. So beyond that- I understand that, all that. You know, I've heard this before. I, I, I don't mean to interrupt and I don't mean to be rude, but I've heard that answer before. The question, and there is an answer to this question, is how much more can be built? I mean, you have so many architects on this, surely somebody can make that analysis because it was promised last time we met that they would. So how come I don't have that answer today, three months later? I, I don't have an answer for you. Sorry, I was not on that last meeting. So uh, <laughs> I do not <laughs> know that that Fair was uh, promised. But Was uh, anybody else there that can answer? But, what we can offer is uh, just the FAR, the, the full massing of what was available as opposed to what we are showing you today, which is the, the, the concept of the design we're moving forward with. What I wanna know is how much more can be built because the community needs it. And then we will go to the politicians and get that money. That's what we as a community does. Thank you, Ms. Jen. It sounds like we probably aren't going to get an answer to that question today. Um, so I'm going to, uh, so I'm going to send you back to the uh, attendees and then I will uh, thank you. And then I have a hand up from Carlin uh, and Carlin can ask one more question and then we will close the public session unless anyone who has not previously commented uh, has something else to say. And they can indicate as such by raising their hands in Zoom. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yes. I have a quick question, a uh, quick follow up, uh, DCAS. Uh, will 70 Mulberry Street, the administration of the building, uh, uh, remain in perpetuity in uh, DCAS's control? Let's say, uh, for instance, the scheduling of the public space. Uh, uh, or is there any plans, maybe in the, down the line, to turn it over to a local nonprofit? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm asking in the, in the you know, about, for fairness. Well, I, I, for fairness, it's a city building that will be run by DCAS. Uh, we will expend resources to run that building to the best of our abilities. Whether I can, I, I can't answer that question regarding perpetuity. Things change, administration change. Um, but as far as I know, the only plans are is for DCAS to run this building to the best of its ability to serve the community.
All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Carlin. And seeing no other hands, Carlin, I'm going to send you back to the attendees. Oh, sorry. I see one more hand that is Hong Sheng Li, the CMP, promoting you now. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. All right, thank you. I'm Hong Li from CMP. I'm one of the five candidates. Um, I think in all fairness, um, Amy had a very valid question that is not political, it's just simply technical. It's how much more we can build um, between where we, uh, what the design is showing now and what is maximum allowable. Um, I think that's a first question. Uh, we worry about raising money later. We worry about the city commitment later. Um, just a very technical one. Um, what is allowable? How much more space we could we could uh, build up? Um, just one quick question. I know we may not be able to get the answer today, but is there a commitment from the city to find out the answer um, somewhere between today and the next meeting? Thank you. Sure, uh, we will take this back and obviously share that with uh, the leadership at our agencies and ensure that um, all the parties involved in this are aware. Uh, I cannot make promises about what the answer will be on the next meeting. Uh, so I just wanna manage expectations there. Um, we are well into this process at this point. Um, but we we will have the conversation uh, with other leadership at our agencies. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm pushing you back to attendees. Seeing no other hands, that is going to close our public comment on this. And so we will now move on to a resolution. Um, I'm going to now share my screen. Can everyone see the resolution? Yes. I can't, I, okay, thank you, Laura. I'm sorry, I can't see faces, so I can't see nods. Um, this is modeled off of the resolution the DDC shared with us. Uh, the purpose of the resolution is to send the preliminary design to the Public Design Commission uh, with our support so that it can move forward. Um, this is what we have. Debate. Well, actually, I suppose I'm going to no, never mind. I guess I'll ask this. Oh, oh, I'll give everyone a moment to read and then I'll ask if anyone has objections or edits. Jake, may I ask, uh, apologies. Um, I actually need to get off uh, soon. Do you need DDC for anything further at this point? Um, we do have members of our team that could stay, but I myself need to leave. Totally okay. 8.30 is uh, well past the agency's bedtime, I'm sure. So um, <laughs> you're free to go. All right. Thank you very much. Thank and you. We, and we will be in touch again. I'm sure. Take care. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, sorry, sorry Jake, but was the first vote called yet? The first vote of the meeting? Yeah. Yeah. When? Well, we took attendance. Oh, was I was I there? Um, if I recall correctly, yes. Okay, okay, thanks. There was a moment that I had to switch from my computer oh, to my phone. Sorry, when that's I... right. I I knew you were present. I Okay, thank you. Thank you. You you got credit. Okay, thanks. Okay, so having reviewed the resolution, um, does anyone have um, amendments? All right, 
Hearing none, I am going to move that the committee recommend, or I guess report this resolution to the full board. Do I hear a second? I'll second that. All right. Um, let's do this by a just show of hands. So if you support, raise your Zoom hand. I'm going to log. Um, Jerome, I appreciate your support, but I, I don't believe that you've been appointed to the committee. Um, all right. All right. Um, and me, Chair. Um, if you oppose, if you would please raise your hand. All right, and abstentions, please raise your hand. Um, Trevor, could I grab your vote? Sorry, I picked the wrong feature. I'm in approval. Great, fantastic. So it carries unanimously. Um, and we will send this along to the Design Commission. Um, thank you, DDC, Grimshaw, everyone who came to present. We very much appreciate your time. Um, that's all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jake. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Um, so we're moving on to our next order of business. Um, and I'm just going to demote a bunch of people. Um, fantastic. And we are back to just the committee. Our final order of business is actually um, a resolution that I am proposing. Uh, I've shared this with the committee um, in advance of the meeting, not all that much advance, my apologies. Um, and I'm going to now share my screen um, so that everyone has an opportunity to read it if they have not already. It's two pages. Uh, the second page is much shorter. You stop sharing. Sorry? You stop sharing. Did that intentionally? Are you sure? It says that I'm still I sharing. Yeah, I can see it. That's me figuring it out, sorry. You're okay. And you should have a copy in your email if that's easier. All right, does anyone have any objection to me scrolling to the next page? No. Okay. There are my citations. Oh, interesting.
So to the extent that folks have not had an opportunity to review the borough president's plan, uh, the thrust of it is twofold. Kind of at the narrow uh, community district level, it proposes specific sites to build new housing, both market rate and subsidized housing, uh, and proposes specific sites where those places should go. In CD3, there were eight sites. We haven't had an opportunity to do due diligence on all of the sites, but for most of them, we've actually already voted on them and approved them. There are some places in Essex Crossing, there are some in the Soho Noho rezoning. So we've already weighed in on those uh, sites and there's nothing else really we can do. But broader, and this is mentioned in the resolution, that the plan calls for borough-wide action. It calls on addressing the housing crisis at a level across all community districts. And as mentioned in the resolution and actually in the borough president's report, CD3 does a pretty good job providing subsidized housing. Uh, we produce the second most of any community district in Manhattan. So we, we are pulling our fair share and we still have a ways to go, right? The, there will never be enough affordable housing in my mind, but we should also be encouraging, in my mind, elected officials to go further in taking a, a borough-wide approach to uh, pushing the community districts that are lagging behind in affordable housing construction and telling them it's time to step up. Uh, it is time to pull your fair share and build some affordable housing so we can take the pressure off of a lot of neighborhoods that are, are really feeling the heat these days. Um, and so that is the resolution. Uh, I will turn it over to the committee with questions or debate, and then we can hear from the public. Uh, Trevor, go ahead. The resolution itself, I mean, it's pretty broad and covers a lot of the issues that we probably all agree on. It's the report by the Manhattan president and it's told that I don't know if anyone had a chance to really look it over because there are some things in there that affect our site and may not affect our site that uh, I'd like to hear opinions from others. For one thing, there's no mention of NYCHA sites at all. And I don't know if that was intentional um, or if maybe it was hidden under one of the street addresses, so you're not able to really recognize it. Um, but I didn't see any of that in the report. The other issue is that he mentions uh, rezones for the, all, most of Manhattan, uh, including the Upper West Side, which he's sponsoring a um, rezoning plan, which is actually a down zoning. He did mention the council members' uh, current uh, support and trying to push through a uh, larger Chinatown working group plan for this area, and there's no mention of all in that his report. Um, so, in, in short, the, the the resolution itself is fine, but I I'm, I'm urge a little caution in terms of just uh, supporting everything in his report. Um, just because I don't know if everyone has a real chance to read that report. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Trevor. And I think just to speak quickly to the NYCHA question, my understanding of the report is that it's talking not about public housing, but rather about uh, private housing that is built that might be subsidized through city funds or otherwise. So I imagine that he probably has plenty of opinions on uh, what we can be doing to uh, better serve our neighbors who live in uh, NYCHA. But, yeah, I was talking more about the soft sites in NYCHA, not the NYCHA uh, situation south of the soft sites. I see. I understand. Um, okay. Noted. Thank you. Uh, Ariadna, go ahead. Sorry, I had two questions. Um, the first is with this resolution, kind of like what Trevor was saying, is that an endorsement of the entire plan or just the part that's relevant to CB3? And then my second is, I was just, this might be a dumb question, but Trevor, could you speak more about like what you're, what, what you would have liked to see in the report related to NYCHA? Anything. <laughs> I didn't see much in terms of it at all. I think it was in 
I don't know if it was intentionally left out or not part of it, where we are talking about housing and building new new opportunities and sites. And um, I, 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 I mean, I haven't studied the the um, report. I did read it when it came out, but I haven't studied it. So I, I, I'm, I, I'm not the expert on answering that question, but I just didn't really see much of that. And Ariana, to answer your first question, um, I think that at least my thrust in writing the resolution, and I'm open to hearing what the committee thinks, was not necessarily endorsing the borough president's plan as it re relates to CD3, but rather endorsing the thrust of the plan, which is that we urge, as the I mean, as the plan says, addressing the affordable housing crisis requires action by a lot of stakeholders, including community boards, and we urge the other stakeholders uh, to invest their time and energy in pushing forward on a borough-wide approach and pushing forward on not just an approach that targets building affordable housing this spot or that spot, but about really taking a, a whole Manhattan approach to it uh, and building housing, affordable housing, subsidized housing, where it's not presently being built. Does that does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thanks. Uh, Alistair, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I had a similar comment um, with Trevor in, in the sense it's an 88 page report. I haven't read the entire report, so it's difficult, difficult for me to say I support the entire report. I read the introduction which makes sense to me. I mean, the main theme is we have an affordable housing crisis because there's not enough housing and we have to build more housing. That, that I agree with in concept. Uh, and we do need to build more affordable housing. It's a matter of you know having the right areas to do it and also provide the right incentives to developers so that they will go. I mean, you can a developer will build anything if he has the right incentives. So uh, I just don't have to plan I don't know how deep the plan goes, and I haven't I haven't read the whole, all of it. I, I, was this presented at the last meeting? No, it hasn't been presented. Uh, it's just been on the agenda. Uh, and I, I can represent at least that the plan is pretty shallow. It doesn't go all of that deep, although it does make some pretty specific proposals uh, outside of CD3. I'm open to, and we can discuss this as a committee, uh, changing the shape of the resolution clause to something that says less act quickly on the borough president's plan because it sounds like a lot of people are not comfortable fully endorsing the plan and instead get at kind of the thrust of the whereas clauses which is uh encouraging stakeholders to take a borough-wide approach to uh addressing the affordable housing crisis and um, accelerating the pace of developing subsidized housing which is not necessarily the letter of the plan, right? The letter of the plan gets into a little bit more specifics than that, but rather uh, that's kind of the spirit of it. Yeah. Uh, but we can talk about that. I think I'd like to hear from, from everyone who's got their hands raised first, but Alistair, did you have something else? Sure, yeah. I think his plan, if I read it, was for 75,000 to like 100 something thousand units. What's distressing at the moment, there are around 50,000 vacant units sitting vacant in New York City because landlords can't don't have the funds to renovate them. Well, they can renovate them, but they can't raise the rents. So there's an immediate fix to put in 50,000 units back on the market. Um, I don't sure. Know and I, I think to the extent that any sort of vacancy control is relevant, that's a, a conversation outside our pay grade that's happening yeah. in Albany. So I hear you. I think mm -hmm. reasonable minds can disagree on that. But yeah. at the moment, kind of what we have here is a, a question of city policy. Okay. Um, Andrea, go ahead. Um, thanks, Jake, for providing some context and background. I just have a tangential question um, just for us to, to kind of think about um, like what what kind of the expectation of of like this resolution is. I just want to know who what what can what CD has the like the largest where you said we're the second um best or whatever or in terms of like housing production do you know what what neighborhood or what's community board is is number one i do not off the top of my head but i can okay. 
check and get back to you very quickly. No worries. Just a tangential question. I was just curious to like look at comparisons. Yeah. Uh, no, it's it's certainly in the report, um, but it's somewhere deep in another community district section. And okay. I only read CD3s because nearest and dearest to my heart. Yep. Um, Thank you. Damaris, go ahead. Hello? Yeah, we can hear you, go ahead. Thanks for your patience, I'm sorry. Um, I think that uh, what I'm interested in understanding is uh, why are we, are we being asked for a resolution of support on this plan? I mean, I think, you know, this plan is large and there are a lot of moving pieces and there are also a lot of other plans uh, including some that we've talked about tonight. And it's difficult to you know, vote in the affirmative for something when it's not clear how it intersects with the other plans that are being pushed forward. And, and then I'm just really not understanding you know, what, what, what we're doing. So if, if maybe you could just um, explain that a little bit more in terms of this resolution and is it being asked for by the board president or is it just to show in the community board of our support? Definitely the latter. Uh, nobody asked us for the resolution and I'm certainly open to hearing if other people have plans that they would like. Uh, for instance, like Trevor mentioned, the Chinatown Working Group uh, would like to ask for the board support on. Uh, I mean, that's something that committee members or non-committee members can bring to the, uh, can bring to the table. Uh, this one, I read Jake, the that, that plan is so old. It, anyway, yeah. <laughs> that, I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. And uh, it's conceivably older than me, as a matter of fact. Well, I mean, I don't mean it to be like a, to knock it. I'm just saying that we've been there already. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that was, that was just an example, but to the, to the extent that folks want to uh, present competing plans or not necessarily competing plans, but other plans, I, uh, they, they are welcome to, to bring those to the committee. Uh, this was one where I received the borough president's plan and I said, I really like the idea of taking this kind of everyone together approach towards addressing the affordable housing crisis. And uh, I sit on the land use committee. And uh, so I put together a resolution and I spoke with a, a couple other members of boards uh, across the borough who are considering similar uh, with the idea being that, you know, borough-wide approach to asking for a borough-wide approach to the affordable housing crisis, uh, if you will. Uh, so, so that's the thrust of it. Uh, I can't say that, you know, it's going to do an awful lot except affirm politically that CB3 I mean, as has been in our the top of our district needs statement uh, since the beginning of time, that affordable housing is a priority for us and, and that we want okay. our officials to so, prioritize. So Jake, them. so since it's not something that was being requested and so there's, it's not like uh, there's a deadline for it. Um, and I think that, you know, there's still some level, of, I could be wrong, of um, lack of knowledge around like all the points in the plan. I just wonder if it would make sense to ask the borough presidents to come and talk about the plan with us so that we, you know, to give us uh, a, a summary of all the most important parts that would be relevant. Sure. So, so, I mean, I'm not trying to give us more work. I'm just saying that I don't feel comfortable, right, voting on something that, I, you know, maybe I should have done my due diligence, but. Sure. Uh, so here's here's the reason why I didn't ask the borough president to come uh, give a report. We in here, at least in in my conception of the uh, of this resolution, are not asking, are not supporting specifically the points in the borough president's plan. If you look at the plan and you scroll down to the CD three section, you'll see that it says. Here are seven sites that we think are, are great candidates for affordable housing. 
And then if you actually look into the sites that are being proposed, we've already voted on five of them. Uh, several are from Essex Crossing. Some of them are uh, parts that were achieved in the, the points of agreement through Soho Noho's rezoning uh, last year, or I guess two years ago now. Uh -oh. um, and so I did not intend to have a resolution here that was saying we endorse every square of the borough president's plan, right? Every page gets the, the CD3 sign off. Um, instead, it's more of a statement of values. Uh, and a, a statement of priority for all of the stakeholders who the plan says, uh, and I agree, need to be involved in prioritizing affordable housing. Does that make sense? I mean, I, 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 I understand the thinking behind it. We can know that. It's not that big a deal. I just wanted to know why we would do that. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't know the... Everything counts, I guess, right? So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that's kind of my position, right? Is that um, I I agree is, is what I'm getting at. I agree that uh, I don't see a path between this and rents in CD3 become affordable uh, necessarily, but I think that everything does count and every statement that we make and every other board makes that affordable housing is a priority of ours uh, is worth making. Uh, that's, that's my position. Um, yeah. Andrea, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I'm hearing what everyone's saying and I understand the concerns also, but I'm wondering, I just feel like I'm wondering if we can do both. Does, is that like something that we can all agree on? Like, and it, I don't know, to me, logically, it seems like a good next step, right? To like discuss the specifics. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm not sure. I just wanted to pose that um, to the rest of the committee. But then also, I don't know if that's like the priority we have here, right? Right. I don't know. What do folks think? I think I'm not really understanding what Andrea is, uh, is saying. Maybe I wasn't fully paying attention. It could be, I mean, in, in an ideal world, and obviously we don't have all the time in the world, but um, it'd be nice to hear from other parties that are involved in affordable housing, whether it's you know some of the stakeholders, um, whether it's developers and other groups, on what the, their their thoughts are on this. Sure, and I think, I mean, I think that it's worth um, separating. I, I hear that. I think that we are kind of going at, I think we're talking a lot about the specific points of the plan, right? Mm -hmm. Where the resolution is not about whether, uh, you know, housing should be built at 44 Suffolk Street. Um, because that that's in the plan, right? It says 44 Suffolk Street is a good spot for new affordable housing, but there are two two issues with that. One of them, um, well, one of them is that we've already voted on that spot, right? That's a part of the Essex Crossing rezoning. Um, and the other thing is that you know we we have uh, that that's not what the, the resolution here is uh, speaking to. It's speaking to the broader approach and the, the borough president's plan is um, kind of a peg for that, right? That's, that's the jumping off point is the idea that we need to be taking a broader approach to new housing that looks at every neighborhood that is not pulling their fair share, that is not pulling their weight. Um, Jake, what about if we said, the, the issue I have is to act quickly on the borough president's plan, yes. because that, that, Im, that implies we've read it, we approve it and all that. Uh, addressing the affordable housing crisis absolutely can be in there, in my, in my opinion. Um, so maybe we say to, um, to address the affordable housing crisis and to, and to look into 
potential solutions um, such as Mark Levine's plan. So something more general and doesn't basically give us, give it, does it doesn't have us give a stamp of approval to his plan because we don't know if we can give the stamp of approval because we don't know exactly what it says, but obviously uh, we can support, um, you know, building more affordable housing. Um, yes. I, yes. I, 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 don't, I don't think anybody in this, in this committee would be against building more affordable housing, hopefully. Um, Alistair, I absolutely agree. And as soon as I put it up on my screen, I realized that that was, um, that was kind of a problem um, that we can't endorse the borough president's plan, or we can't say act quickly to take a, to address the borough president's plan if we are not all on the same page about the borough president's plan. Um, Maybe we say without an, without an, and and without an, without endorsing or we uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's like taking a neutral stance on his plan somehow. Yeah. Um, if you say not we, we we're not endorsing the plan, that might come off as a negative. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure if you want to you know if there's a, a neutral way to to put it down. Um, Uh, what do other folks think about that? Damaris, I see your hand is still up. Is that from before or, or is that something new? That's from before. I'll lower it now. Okay. In addressing the affordable housing crisis plan. Uh, what, what do other folks think about that amendment or that kind of suggestion for a direction of amendment? How about saying um, to address the affordable house, housing crisis by building more, by building more housing, and to look into possible, um, into potential solutions such as Mark Mark Levine's plan, uh, you know. I mean, I don't think we can just say building housing. I think we've got to be specific. I mean, is, so uh, the president's um, let me change this to. How about instead of look into examine potential? And all right. Um, there is one thing that I'm noticing in that um, dear Ford resolve. It talks about developers, property owners, and developers. Well, there there is a contingency of people that fits all of that, and that's actually affordable housing developers. It's a specific group that provided most of the housing that has been built in, in, in the boroughs. They are property owners because this in fact they have to be managing some of those buildings. They are developers because they did initiate most of the development that has happened in the low east side, whether it's nature or or the um, what we call the HDFCs or stuff like that, and they should be mentioned as part of this um, contingency of people that is listed there. So, Herman, could well actually before we do that, I want to ask the committee what they think about what we have now and that therefore be it resolved and then we can move on to to another amendment um just not taking a formal vote taking a kind of temperature check where are we at all right jake so you're asking us so we approve of the resolution as you have it written now no I'm asking if you approve of the amendment to the resolution as we have it now, which does not lock you into supporting the resolution ultimately. 
Okay, and then I have a question because I'm I'm just reading the report now. Yeah. The the sites that are listed. Yeah. These are not the sites that are the affordable housing is going to or that has been brought to the community board just yet. Because I'm going down to the privately owned market rate sites and they have the Con Ed parking as a possible affordable housing, but I wasn't sure if that was already a part of a conversation. Um, which site is that? So that's 181 Avenue D. That's on 13th Street and Avenue D. That's now a parking lot, but now it says it's a possible, it can host 306 units. So that's not something that has been bought to us just yet. No, it is not. That's right. Um, and is that, I mean, that's, yeah. Okay, Trevor, go ahead. I don't necessarily have a problem with the language, the new language here, but I think we're, we're sort of getting into two issues. And one issue is whether we've examined, studied, and approved of the Manhattan Borough's presence plan. And the other issue is this resolution in South, which is more or less supporting the broad principles. And if we're looking at just supporting housing principles as opposed to just supporting a borough plan. Um, I know Demiris had raised the issue of timeliness and, and whether the city planning, uh, I'm sorry, the borough president's office should uh, present this or give us some information. But if we're going to do this resolution, we cannot, and I don't know if this is the only place where that language is, we shouldn't, we should make sure we don't tie into that plan, um, especially since most folks haven't gone through most of the pages in that report. Sure. So is that, am I hearing kind of objection to the amendment? No, my, my point is that I don't, I don't have a problem with this amendment language right here. But okay. I think we're looking at two different things and, and like we're going back and forth between these two issues of the plan itself and this resolution. But I, I want to hear what, I know Demaris has her hand raised, so I'm going to lower mine. Yeah, Demaris, go ahead. I mean, I was just going to say that I, I um, agree. <laughs> Um, I don't like the amended language, really. I don't think that it's specific enough, but overall, I mean, I think it's difficult. I mean, I really, I, I understand what you were trying to do, Jake, and I, um, and I, and I, and I appreciate that, but I think that if we're going to say something positive or in the spirit or in response to this plan, given that we don't all know the contents of it and we don't think that at this point because i don't know seven and five out of the seven projects for our district have already been completed and i get that rationale too um but you know i'm not comfortable uh, naming the plan so i would also err on the side of using more general language around you know collaboration and affordable housing versus maybe being so specific. And if you feel strongly that we should be specific, then then I guess I wanna just you know, I'll put a plug in for either more time or uh, you know a, a better, maybe something you can point to for us to look at that might feel, you know, or give us the kind of information that we might uh, feel more comfortable with to you know, move forward with a positive resolution. Sure. What What do you mean by something that might make you feel more comfortable? Well, I'm just saying, you know, like in the absence of being able to read the entire plan on this call. Yeah. Right. You know, I mean, that's not something that I that I can do. And I don't think that it is. Um, I mean, I mean, I don't think it's reasonable. Right. So um, if if this is if we're not if we're going to not be able. To, OK, so I guess what I'm saying is if we're not going to um pass a resolution that supports like you said you know the the statement of values right like you know the the encouraging you know collaboration and folks working together versus supporting the borough president's plan mostly because people are not 
completely versed in the plan. Uh, I think I'm losing my track of what I'm saying at this point. Um, that's okay. It's <laughs> I'm also losing track of what I'm saying. Uh, Ariadna, go ahead. So I think in the way that it's written right now, we're just using the borough president's plan as an example of something and everything else above it is restating the principles that are outlined there. So I don't think we're endorsing anymore the plan. We're just saying that we think everybody should, you know, consider this plan and others. Um, so I'd be fine with if we vote on this as and see what people think. Yes, that was exactly my intent. Um, All right, so let's just, it's, it's 9.07. Well, let's hear from Dominic first, and then I think we will, we can do a, a consent adoption of the amendment, and then we can uh, debate the the resolution in its entirety. <laughs> okay. And hopefully not too long, and then I think we also might have a member of the public who'd like to speak, and so we should um, hear from them. Uh, Dominic, go ahead. Yeah, no, I just, I sorry, I missed some of the conversation. There was a big fire on the street that, that I was distracted by. That, that um, seems like good cause. <laughs> um, so I guess my, the one thing I'm curious about, like I, I think I understood what Damaris was saying, um, but so is there a reason why we have to vote on this tonight? Because like I know generally I would like to hear a presentation by the borough president's office. Um, and maybe that could help inform other principles and, you know, sort of give us more context. Like, is there a reason why we need to vote on this tonight? If it's kind of, if it's broad, like, are we trying to be the first to push for this or, you know, what's the, what, what, what's the impetus? Yeah. I mean, wouldn't we look great in the papers if we were the first community board to do this? No. Um, I mean, they, there, there's no real impetus. It's not like when you have a, a zoning text amendment or something uh, that, uh, you know, there's a 60-day clock and, and the clock is taking on this. The impetus is that the longer we wait after the borough presidents, I mean, because this is, this is entirely political, right? And the longer we wait, the, the politics of it kind of start to... Uh, slow down. I'm totally open, though, to having the borough president come and give an informational presentation on the uh, on the plan. My view of what the presentation will entail, though, is that it won't really be helpful in informing whether we support this resolution. And I think that uh, that if the borough president came to speak, what we would hear most from him or from his staff would be um, specific information, you know, about the the post office or about the um, the Essex Crossing sites uh, where they're proposing adding new housing. Uh, so that that's why I didn't invite him, uh, and I agree that there's no like ticking clock here, except that uh, you know it is good to be close in time to when the report dropped and the report um, was issued uh, since our last meeting. And so this is the first time that we've had an opportunity to uh, to kind of talk about it. Um, okay. So, so if you could catch me up really fast. So did we kind of take, we were removed from the resolution, but like, I just want to make sure if we're voting on this, it cites it as an example. But it's not something where, like, let's say there's something that's in that report that we realize, like, oh my gosh, we should not have, we should not have supported that because of this one or two things, that that that's going to bite us. So yeah. is it is it? Did you? I know you. I saw y'all doing some editing. So is it generic enough that it's? In that my that's... view, in my view, yes. Uh, so the the language we have here is that Manhattan Community Board 3 calls on all stakeholders, dot, 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 to act quickly to take a borough-wide approach in addressing the affordable housing crisis and examine potential solutions such as the borough president's housing Manhattanites plan. So we're calling on stakeholders to examine solution, potential solutions such as the plan, um, which I think gets us to generic enough territory 
Okay. That All right. Rest of the plan. All right. Cool. Thank you. Trevor, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to, because we've been discussing this for a while, but, you know, I I, I hear um, Demiris' concern, and I think it would be helpful if we saw a presentation. If they, they can present what they want, but at least it gives people an opportunity to go over this report. But, you know, it, whatever folks think, um, I'm okay with it. The other thing is the title of the motion would have to change, too. Um, and I don't know what that would be, um, but it would what we'd, uh, we'd have to support something so yes that's, that's all a, that's a good call um and we can we can change that i suppose um um for um okay Alistair, I think last comment, and then let's adopt this amendment. Herman had something, and then um, hear from the public, and then um, we can take a vote, I guess. Alistair, go ahead. Um, yeah, I think the title should be changed. Um, I think if you want, I'm fine doing a generic resolution like this but if you if you wanted a stronger resolution i would say and it's up to i guess it's up to you jake or all of us if you wanted a stronger resolution then i'd say it'd be better if we had time to read read the plan and maybe have a presentation so it, i could go either way i could do a generic but if we all had more information we could probably make a better or more more specific resolution Again, I, I I don't mind I, I, either way. It's just just two two different options. Sure. So here's what I'll offer to to save us a little bit of time. If someone wanted to make a motion to pass this by for a month, and so that would push it to next month, um, and then. Uh, we take a vote on that. If the committee decides that we want to push it a month so that people can review the plan, uh, we can have the borough president give a report uh, and then take a vote. We can do that. I will, for the record, oppose that. But uh, at the very least, we can push it to next month and save us some time uh, discussing it. So if anyone would like to make that motion, uh, the floor is yours. I would like to make that the motion that we postponed it for a month. All right, I hear a motion to pass by for the month. A second. 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 All right, so we are going to do a quick vote. Um, let's just do show of hands. And I'm gonna lower everyone's hands now. All right. All in favor of the motion to postpone for till next month, the motion to pass by for a month, please raise your hand. All right, and that motion carries six to three. So we will put this on the agenda for next month. Um, and then, um, uh, yeah. We will, I will ask the, to see if the borough president's team can give a presentation in April. Um, great. So we have three people in the audience who still have their hands raised, um, but I don't think we have any live issues. So I think we'll take final attendance and then uh, call it a night, unless there's any objection to that. Is there a motion to adjourn? Um, I think we got to take final attendance first. So yeah, let's okay. Let me grab that and stop sharing my screen. Jake, will you email the Manhattan Nights plan again to everyone just so everybody has it? Yes, I will send it out. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. And and Jake, the folks still in the audience, they don't their questions are related to what we just discussed, or, we, or were they going to raise something else? Um, I'm not sure. We have uh well, I don't know if this is proper, but. Let's call it other business. Uh, I'm promoting 
may lead to panelists. Hi, everyone. Um, Hi. So I'm glad you let us ask questions and let us, you know, say what we wanted to say, um, because it, what I have to say is related. Um, so it's, I think Dominic knows this the best. Um, but, you know, one of the sites that was identified, in, and I'm glad you decided not to include the name of the report in your resolution, if I'm correct. Um, but um, one of the sites identified um, in the report is actually, it is a site that was voted on by the community board, but it is a site for the school. And um, it is our position that there should be a school there because we voted on it and I don't recall a vote to change the position. So um, I, you know, I would like to hear from the Manhattan Borough President, you know, how they came about it and how they see the new school, you know, how to strategize for it, you know, are we building more housing that will bring the families who would go to a school or, or some other strategy for it. So, um, yeah, so that was really a cause for concern. So I hope that you have the, um, if you have, I'm not on this committee, but if you have um, someone from their office to come to give a report or presentation um, with an opportunity to ask questions, I mean, I would certainly be interested in going and I'm sure it's, you know, to, to ask about that specifically. All right, thank you, May, appreciate it. And I know that that at 44 Suffolk is a kind of live issue. Um, I'm, I'm gonna kick you back to attendee land now, but thank you for raising that. Uh, and Andrew Berman, promoting you to panelist, um, although if you have something to say about the prior, if you have anything to add about the prior resolution. Um, no, since it's... Uh, yeah, come back next month. It, it's, it's, it's coming back next month. But the idea was, uh, if you list a group of people, the, per, the people who are mostly responsible and could be credited for a lot of affordable housing is mostly the community-based organization who have done it in the Bronx, Brooklyn, uh, Hoptown, Manhattan. And Bronx is the first for that question. Bronx is the, the, the borough with the most affordable housing because they had better better structures. I we were, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Herman, but I thought we were letting the final people speak. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm but, sorry, Herman. I was giving you another 15 seconds. Yeah, but um, it let's Andrew, wait for next month. Yeah, we'll talk. We'll talk about it next month. Uh, Andrew, go ahead. But if it's about the the resolution that's pushing to next month, then maybe you can save it till uh, April. Uh, okay, well, uh, I'll just quickly say that I'm glad it's being pushed into next month. Um, I would strongly encourage the board to you know, really look at the particulars. And I just wanna quickly highlight that the Cooper Station Post Office, Community Board 3 has actually a long history and connection to that site. The air rights from it were used in a highly controversial manner that the Community Board opposed for the NYU dorm uh, next door. So the notion of further developing that site has a lot of very, um, vexed issues connected to it. Andrew, I'm sorry to cut you off. It's just we can get into this next month when we talk about the actual resolution. But so we no live issue with them. We have a that. motion on the floor. Or we're taking attendance to complete it. Yes, that's right. I I opened it briefly to other comments in case it was something uh that's not related to uh yeah and we all walk straight all right. through it. <laughs> thank, thank you, Andrew. Appreciate it. Take care. Sending you back to attendee lands now. Um, all right, so let us- take, Would you like me to take attendance? I'm taking notes. Yes, please. Sure, okay. Jake Gold. Present. Damaris Reyes. Present. Alistair Economakis. Yes. Andrea Gordillo, yes. Herman Hewitt. Yes. Trevor Holland. Yes. Laura Lugo. Here. Sandra Strother. Jackie Wong. Dominic Berg. Yes. Ariana Chua. Yes. Steve Herrick. 
Megan Joy, and Anisha Stephen. Thanks, everyone. And thank Hi. you, Jake, for sharing. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Uh, <laughs> take care. Have a good evening, everyone. Thanks for staying thank up you. late. Hopefully next month will be a little quieter. Thanks, guys. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Jake, for pitching in.